Welcome, and thank you for tuning in to the final webinar of Season 4 of Creatively United's Climate and Artists series. I'm Frances Littman, the founder of the Creatively United for the Planet Nonprofit Society. We would like to gratefully acknowledge the stewardship of the plants, trees, waters, and land by all generations of First Peoples, past, present, and future, in whose territories we share the privilege, privilege to live, work, play, and create on. I'm grateful to be here on the Esquimalt Songhees First Nations territories. We'd also like to thank our lead partner in this series, Jonathan Reardon of the Gail Reardon Victoria Foundation Legacy Fund as well as our community supporters, Lifestyle Markets, Spinnaker's Brew Pub, Horn Coupar, McAvoy Rule, and Miles Craig of KauaiPerfection.com. Just a reminder that every day is Earth Day on creativelyunited.org, where you can share and find ongoing events, resources, a pair-up directory of more than 175 incredible organizations, videos, a place to blog, and much more. Our webinar library can also be found on creativelyunited.org and YouTube, and we really encourage you to subscribe. Today, we have an incredible program with eight guests. We'll explore the theme, we're all in this together, now what? The science is clear. A 40% reduction in carbon emissions is required in the next five to eight years for us to avert climate catastrophe. It's imperative for humans to shift from climate problems to solutions and do it quickly. The good news is solutions exist. How do we accelerate the needed changes? We'll hear from a variety of people whose antidote to despair is action and learn about why they are taking action and what actions they are taking. We'll hear how we can build a new story for civilization through collaboration and transformation through engagement. Art opens hearts, eyes, and removes barriers, and it even breaks down walls. Art articulates the impossible. Our first guest, Claire Atwell, is a textile and multimedia artist who has pioneered innovative fabric art techniques for more than 30 years. When she's not working on her own art, Claire works as a community artist, using the arts in imaginative ways to help community groups explore complex issues such as cultural and spiritual identity, including community visioning. I had the pleasure of seeing some of Claire's new work at a recent artist studio tour and was drawn to the beauty and complexity of this multi-layered piece whose title and inspiration speaks so artfully to today's webinar theme. We're all in this together. Welcome, Claire, artist extraordinaire. Who better than to tell us the title and inspiration behind this piece you conceived and engineered from multiple layers of sheer fabric? What a feat. Tell us more. Thanks, Francis. And it was so much fun to have you come into the actual studio tour and see it in person. Yeah, so Ruach means um, sacred breath in Hebrew. And I had been listening to a talk by David Abram, who is an ecologist and a philosopher. He had been describing how gravity holds us to the earth and um, and that it's part of the, the physics of, of the earth and that the clouds that are above us aren't whipping past at um, the almost thousand miles an hour that the earth is spinning at. And so we're not on the earth, we're actually in it and we're part of it. And then he went on to talk about, and this is the part that really got me, was um, every time we breathe air in, um, we're breathing in the oxygen that's gifted to us by all of the plant life. And, um, and that once that air has that oxygen has traveled through our body, we exhale as carbon dioxide. And that the carbon dioxide, um, we're actually, even on a planetary scale, it seems minuscule, but we're actually changing the chemical balance of the atmosphere of the earth, which means that we're part of this living earth. And um, yeah, that just so inspired me. So yeah, this piece was really trying to pick up on the breath, the, um, the, the fact that we barely think about 
how we are interacting every day as a living, interconnected, interdependent, co-creating part of the earth. Let's see the video. You have a little video mm -hmm. of, of the piece so we can see it three-dimensionally. And yeah. I know I was just so struck when I came into your gallery and I saw this piece. Yeah, tell us, like, you like to do these types of pieces because I know you're greatly inspired by authors and people and talks that you've heard. Yeah, but it's the connection to the earth and... Um, and it's also, I think energy comes into my work a lot and, um, and the spiral has always been really important. And so there are many layers that, um, that are very difficult sometimes to how do you capture all of that and yet still keep the lightness of what you're holding. And um, so, yeah, the, the different seasons, the four directions, um, the compass, the circular piece are all kind of embedded as layers into the piece. Um, and then just being able to play with the humans and the animals and the all of life that is also going through these cyclical times because everything changes and is on that scaffolding. We're part of this temporal pattern of the earth. And so I was trying to trying to pick that up as well. Well, it's just an absolutely beautiful piece. And, and I thought, what a great opener to the show. So thank you, Claire, for joining us. Our next guest, Gwyn Bridge, she works on natural resource issues within Indigenous people to ensure mutual benefits and equality and decision making with all levels of government. She's adept in establishing new conceptual frameworks to support equity and negotiating government to government agreements. And Gwen's mission is to improve relationships between indigenous nations and their partners. So people and natural resources conditions are improved. Gwen is a member of the Saddle Lake Cree Nation in Alberta, Canada. We're very fortunate to have Gwen Bridge share her wealth of wisdom with us again in this quick pre-recorded interview. Welcome, Gwen. Thank you so much for joining us again. So how would you describe the difference in the two world views held by the government of British Columbia and the Indigenous people across the province? Thank you, Francis, for having me again. It's a pleasure to be here. I think that I've been exploring this question for quite some time and have come to some conclusions which help to illuminate our collective understanding of some of those differences. One, of course, on the Western side or the Canadian side is that we have um, a jurisdictional authority grounded in um, humanity and grounded in the human people themselves. Essentially, the God of the Western civilizations delegated authority for what happens to the animals, the plants and natural resources to the humans. He, as far as I understand, said, we hope, or I hope that you will uh, do right and have harmonious relationships, but ultimately the authority for the fate of the, the earth and its um, living things is up to you. On the indigenous side, the creator delegated the authority for the determination of not only their own fate, but the fate of humans to the animals and plants themselves. So um, I use the Okanagan example a lot because they've been gracious to share with me for almost a decade and a half that the creator said to the Bitterroot, to the Saskatoon, to the Black Bear and to the Salmon, you animals and plants get to determine the fate of these humans which are now arriving. And luckily for the Okanagan, the animals and plants decided to give of themselves so that the humans could survive. So we have fundamentally this um, authority for the um, fate of the systems held within these two uh, different entities, one on the humans on the Western side and then one in the animals and the plants themselves. So when it comes to decision making and subsequent uh, law creation, those fundamental authorities are really dictating how the differences play out um, and why we have these um, challenges with reconciliation between those two worldviews. Right. And I do recall hearing once, um, and I'm sure this is, it, this may be a broad statement for all sort of first peoples that the land doesn't belong to us. We belong to the land. Yeah. Well, I think that's a, a sort of philosophical premise, right? And the authority is yeah vested in the land and the animals on the indigenous side, but Subsequently, what devolves from that is the authority of the um, 
those those not knowledge base in itself, right? And I compare that to the scientific way of viewing and the sort of indigenous way of viewing we have on the Western side, a really a long, well, relatively <laughs> long tradition, not as long as indigenous perspectives of trying to understand the natural world through observation and drawing conclusions. And on the indigenous side, the same process has occurred in North America for many, many millennia longer. But what the interesting difference is there is that on the Western side, when you think about um, sort of the messaging that the earth is telling us through scientific observation, it doesn't carry any weight. It doesn't result in a direct change of behavior to the participants in the Western society. It has to go through this policy validation process. On the indigenous side, what the earth and the animals are saying provides a direct um, a direct obligation or a direct feedback mechanism for the way that Indigenous people behave within their society. So on one side, what the earth says is the law and is listened to. On the Western side, what the earth says um, is doesn't have any inherent authority and is subjected to this policy validation feedback loop. So when we're trying to think about you know, the creating and braiding and creating integrations between, say, science observation and traditional knowledge observation, there is a lot of equivalency in that they are both earth observation methodologies. But beyond that, the difference in the authority that that information carries uh, in its ability to influence the way that we behave directly is very, very different. So, and I would espouse to your question that it's, this is not necessarily a pan-Indigenous framework, but it's been helpful um, for many people to begin to deepen their understanding as we advance through this reconciliation process. Mm, thank you. And how do you see the shift in power between the government and Indigenous people under the Declaration of Rights of Indigenous People, also known as DRIPA? In the recent DRIPA Action Plan of March um, 2022, we saw this notion amongst many other good things, but particularly this notion of legal pluralism and how we begin to understand the fact that there's two valid jurisdictional um, frameworks on the same land base. And what's most important there is that the um, Western side, the Western legal system understand the indigenous legal system. And fundamentally it's about that um, most highest level of authority, which I just mentioned, and really beginning to grasp that the authority, the assumptions we make on the Western side about the authority being vested in humans to make decisions about the outcomes of our natural systems is fundamentally different from the authority that the animals have and that the human, the subsequent human decisions are in line with what the animals themselves or the ecology say, right? So it's, it's an inverse kind of um, process. So in relation to how the province begins to tackle that, I mean, first is understanding, I use a an ethical space-based framework that I'm working on that was coming out of Willie Ermine and Reg Croshu, but really thinking about the first step is this understanding and acknowledgement of these fundamental differences of these hierarchical and legislative levels, uh, that sort of inverse power of the earth observation information that needs to be understood. So um, that's the first step. And then you know, some of the work that I've been doing recently is, well, when we begin to think about what policy and legislative shifts are needed, um, as per the UNDRIP and DRIPA requirements, you know, beginning to frame policy which reflects that authority um, is certainly a challenge, but the province in some of their ministries has begun to explore what that might mean. So Wonderful. And, and it, we hear the expression rights of nature. That's coming into more um, legal cases. We're hearing where rivers are being given the right of nature. Is that it figure into this at all? I think that's an important step, a transitionary step, if you will, towards the recognition that there is indeed these um, rights of nature, that they are the authority. What the challenge is there, and I call it a transition step, because it's still the assumption that a humans get to determine whether those things have rights or not, right? So the, that inherent vestment of that ultimate authority is still missing, and that's why it's this transitionary process. But it's an important first step, definitely. Right. Well, we have titled this webinar, We're All in This Together. So are, are you optimistic that the government and Indigenous people will develop a truly joint working relationship that will enable us to live within nature's limits and shift towards uh, zero net carbon emissions? 
I think the the um, last parts of your question, the within nature's limits and shift towards zero carbon, is certainly the challenge. I think there's a lot of examples even now of First Nations and the government beginning to develop really functional and effective relationships for making land use decisions. There's um, a lot of work to be done to get to that living within nature's limits. And I think Indigenous people certainly have a lot of expertise to share with the West of us about what that means. One of the most important components for that conversation is the development of the economic rationale to support a sustainable or a viable ecological future. Indigenous peoples um, almost have this responsibility to begin to articulate that with the economic rationale to be able to have those conversations which are less one-sided. Currently the government's economic rationale um, read something like this. Well, we'd love to do that, but it's going to cost 600 jobs, so therefore we can't. And in conversation with First Nations, the First Nations, a lot of the times, um, are not able to argue back with a fulsome economic rationale that is built upon not only their own Indigenous economy um, rationale, but also the ecological rationale. So that's an area I think that's really important to to bring some broader, perhaps global expertise uh, into that conversation to support that dynamic. So um, I think that's a necessity, that, that economic rationale. Um, and I think that in BC and in Canada generally, in relation to conservation um, and other ecosystem preservations, we've had this attitude, well, we're such a big country, we'll just sort of carve off this place and just leave it alone. And that'll be fine. We don't have to sort of think about it in the context of our large landscape uh, services and economic um, functionality. But now I think we really need to begin addressing that integrated economic approach. Uh, I think people are starting to see that everything is interrelated. If you don't have this, you don't have that. And and I, that expression that there's no business to be done on a dead planet is maybe starting to resonate a little bit now that people are experiencing changes in weather, et cetera. Is there anything the public can do to be more supportive of the process or help move things forward? I think one of the most important things to be done is to begin to um, seek understanding or knowledge about Indigenous perspectives, for sure. If um, and an openness and receptivity from the broader public to um, think through what um, the province's commitments might mean for um, say legal pluralism or joint jurisdiction over natural resource decision-making. I think many people may be feeling nervous about what that might mean in terms of um, the government seeking to have joint decision-making with First Nations and having less of an opportunity for the priorities of constituents to um, be paramount. Um, so I think, but I think that there's, um, once you have greater understanding and fundamentally a questioning of some of the attitudes around why we would not want Indigenous people to be decision makers on the land is an important area of work for Canadians generally because of the legacy of essentially systemic racism that we all absorbed of when we were going through school and, and growing up in Canada. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, there is so much to talk about on all of these topics. Um, and so I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit with you guys um, and to continue to have these conversations and certainly welcome uh, inquiries to me to, to discuss this further if anyone has any interest. Being connected underlies the theme of today's webinar. We're all in this together. This short two-minute film trailer speaks to the creative intelligence of nature and was just released by Victoria BC author Wayne Foster, a lifelong meditator who has graciously donated two of his Being Connected books to a draw for those who are willing to fill out a pledge to take an action based on something they learned from today's webinar. Please visit creativelyunited.org's homepage to enter. Winners will be announced in our upcoming newsletters. We live in a stunning natural world where everything connects to everything else. Trees are engaged in conversations with each other all the time. Conversations that are happening right under our feet. Elephants bond with each other as well as with people in unimaginable ways. Starlings instantly shift into unique shapes 
flying together, moving as if connected as one. The connections in nature are everywhere. And people are more connected than we think. A mother's heart will start to beat at the same rhythm as her baby when they embrace, naturally. And when watching a live theatre performance, the audience will start to synchronise breathing and heart rates during passionate moments. People are connected. Nature is connected. Human nature and nature itself are not two things. They are one. Taken together, the stories in being connected enliven something special in us. They enliven the sense we are on this journey together. They enliven the connection with ourselves and with nature. Wayne Foster's book, Being Connected, is available from Lifestyle Markets here in Victoria and Bolin Books. But you can also um, visit his website, beingconnectedbook.com. So our next guest, Thomas Tuin, is a biophiliac. He is dedicated to the survival of our civilization and all life on Earth. He's been deeply engaged in business, food production, oil, expo oil exploration, mining, community, economic development, manufacturing, information technology, technologies, and all areas of politics. He lives on an organic urban farm in Sydney, BC. He's car free, and he and his wife, and the love of his life, actually, Laura, have affectionately have effectively reduced their footprint by 80% while boosting their lifestyle to new heights. Thomas's experience has made clear to him that our future as a civilization depends on our ability to adapt to our collective worldview so that we're able to embrace and solve the challenges of our times. Welcome, Thomas. Thank you, Francis. I'm so happy to be here. Oh, you have connected a lot of dots with your life experience and you live your life with a as gentle of a footprint as possible. I know you personally, and I know what a gem of a person you are. What suggestions do you have for where do we go from here? Well, Francis, um, that's a big question. And uh, the first sort of thought I want to put in people's minds along that journey of uh, where we go from here is that we can only see beyond horizons because we have the opportunity to stand on the shoulders of giants. It's paraphrasing an old, uh, an old saying, but it's really true. Um, the, one of the things that uh, Ronald Wright pointed out to us in his book, um, A Brief History of Progress, is that we really knocked out, uh, as we climbed the ladder of progress, we knocked out the rungs underneath us. So going forward is the only direction we can take. Um, but no person can do it alone. We can't do is live in this planet alone. The previous video just exemplified that as did the, the first uh, Claire's presentation that uh, we all breathe the same air. Um, First Nations have known this all along that you can't do things alone. You're interconnected to everything around you. Life is a whole, it's not individual parts. Um, so we organize ourselves in, into tribes. We've always organized ourselves into tribes. And, uh, and we do that in order to feel safe, in order to feel secure. And when we do that, within a tribe, we have a culture of protection. The things that are, we consider to be within our tribe, we cherish, we love, we care for, we uh, preserve. Um, and this is why the First Nations uh, approach to nature is so powerful because they include in their tribe, not just the people, but also all the things that the earth has offered us. Um, but as we've grown as a civilization, we've had more capacity. And with that capacity comes responsibility. And from where I stand at this point in my life, I think that one of the key things that we have to uh, address ourselves to is how do we grow our tribe? Mm -hmm. How do we grow the tribe from being um, just a tribe of our community, a tribe of our city, a tribe of our province or our country to a tribe of the planet, mm -hmm. all life on the planet, if we can include all life on the planet as part of our tribal uh, thinking, 
then we now afford all those all that community the entire planet all the living creatures all the living all the different uh, ethnic groups and races and everybody else the same opportunity and the same respect that we would give our family and that i think is a paradigm shift that we really need in order to mobilize the kind of actions that are necessary today oh i would wholeheartedly agree and and we've gone from being in circle around uh, the fire the campfire or the village square and it seems that we ever since the romans we've been put into a grid system and buildings uh, separated so bringing it all back together uh, is how do you how do you envision that happening well, it's uh, it's it's difficult to do because there's some things that inherently we do to protect ourselves, to protect our thinking, and to protect the people and and the, and the things we love, right? And again, we can't do it alone. So we need to help each other reach beyond those limitations, right? And and there's lots of ways of doing that, uh, but I think the first step is to make a commitment that we want to do this. Mm -hmm. Right, and this is where uh, what I've done is I've started, and it's, I think it's in the chat somewhere or in the in the Q and A somewhere on my bio, uh, a, a, an opportunity for people to commit themselves through a pledge to build a new tomorrow, which is simply a pledge that says, I know it's important for the whole of humanity to recognize that our tribe is now global, and I will do my best in my daily activities, my daily sphere of influence, to encourage that thinking, right. Mm -hmm. And if more and more people make that commitment, it throws a switch in their minds and says, OK, I've made that commitment. And, and, and the commitment part, I think I liken it to a, a wedding. You know, you can say, oh, I like you. Yeah, we're married and that's it. Right. But is that really a commitment? Right. Do we not want to make some kind of a formal statement, have a celebration, gather people around, sign a document? have a, uh, a, some kind of a ritual so that we know we've made that commitment so that we can remember that event where we've made that commitment. I think a commitment is important. So if we feel it in our hearts to actually do this, then the next step is to actually commit ourselves to do that. And this is what my website affords people to do. Yes, newtomorrow.ca. We have that in the chat and we'll include that with the replay link. I, I just love what you're doing, Thomas. I hope people check out your website. And uh, is there anything else you'd like to add? Only that we need to be gentle on ourselves, um, but that this is a critical moment in our human history. Um, the opportunity is massive. We can build a better world. We have the technology, we have the capability, as you've often said but we need to have the commitment to actually make it so. And the commitment is individuals and not just pointing the finger to all the other people that aren't doing the job. The commitment is individuals to actually make the difference. So true. And the, you know, the good news is that solutions exist. It's not like we're reinventing the wheel. And that's what I recently spoke about in my TEDx talk um, from Surrey, that if anyone's watched it, it's, you know, how to heal the earth, not steal the earth, or yeah. steal, heal the future, not steal the future. So, and, and it talks to this. And uh, Thomas, I just love that you've put this together and I encourage people to visit your website. There's, it's a wealth of knowledge. We could have Thomas on for a full program because he's so well, you can go in so many directions with you thomas and i love i love that your heart is so open to doing the right thing so thank you for joining us thank you our next guest is somebody who is taking climate activism to another level jim bronson is a scientist and lover of the natural world and he wants the best absolute best possible future for his grandchildren. In 2018, he began leading classes based on solutions to the climate crisis outlined in Paul Hawkins' book, Drawdown. And he was a founding member of Drawdown BC. Jim, you lead online Saturday Solution Synergy so sessions and with your partner, Sandy Goldie, who I just love every two months where people from the US and Canada meet to inspire one another with their work for a healthy planet. And I just love attending your sessions and, and you guys are fabulous f facilitators. And anybody who attends these sessions leaves with new inspiration every time. So Jim, please share with us your um, drawdown presentation and tell us how people can get involved. 
Wow, what a wonderful introduction. Thank you, Francis, so much. And it, I have to say it's so delightful to be with this group that you've gathered today. My goodness, <laughs> what a delightful and motivated and clear thinking and big hearted group of people. Always. <laughs> It, I think it's you, Francis. I think no, no. You, it's, it's, you know, we have a, a amazing, amazing presenters, an amazing audience. And, you know, it's the people that are tuning into these programs. I give everybody credit for being on this show. It's no one person. As we heard, this takes a community. So please, Jim, tell us about what you've got to uh, uh, share with, about Drawdown and why this is important. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Francis. I'll share my screen. So I'd just like to begin by honoring the indigenous people of the Rogue River Valley here in Oregon. I live near Ashland, and these folks are now living in the Grand Ronde and the Silets Reservation. And this is really due to not having a vision of how everybody is important in the planet. That silly and narrow-minded attitude of colonization. And so we just honor that these people are still here with us and providing wisdom for us. And one of the wonderful examples of the world's tribes coming together was at COP26. And I just love this image of the earth being elevated with many, many people, nonprofits, for profits, foundations, companies working to elevate the earth into a higher place of being safe and sustainable. One of those organizations is Project Drawdown. And so I'm just gonna highlight for you a couple of things that Project Drawdown is thinking of for their future. From a webinar that was given April 28th, I've taken some of the information. It began with Jonathan Foley, the executive director, giving the big picture. And then there are three divisions. They have Drawdown Lift, which is talking about lifting people from around the world into higher functioning, better lives, and doing that through climate solutions. And then there's Drawdown Stories with Matt Scott. Matt is a specialist in relating information about Drawdown to people's lives. And then finally, Drawdown Labs, Jamie Alexander is focused on bringing together the forces of businesses, foundations, financial institutions, and to bring that to bear on making climate solutions more effective and scaled up. And so just to remember once again what Drawdown means, Drawdown is that point in time when greenhouse gas emissions that are polluting our atmosphere stop increasing and begin decreasing, we're actually drawing down the pollutions that are ruining our climate and ruining the future of our children. And so Drawdown is um, also an organization called Project Drawdown, where they look at bringing together all the solutions that will take us to the point of drawdown in the future. So the big picture, Jonathan Foley noticed and presented that over 25 years, we need to invest $25 trillion, easy to remember. And this will result in a savings of $125 trillion in cash. And in addition, to the cash in calculable savings in protected and restored ecosystems and diversity. So that's the big picture. Project Drawdown works in these areas, advancing effective climate strategy, getting beyond solutions to climate strategies, evaluating the strategies, finding the benefits to nature and the co-benefits to people and human well-being. Also improving the climate conversation, making sure that we look at climate solutions with possibility and opportunity, grounding the conversations in good science, speaking to issues that people care about most, their jobs, their health, their equity, the community, their security, all of our security. And Drawdown is very motivated by 
the new and diverse voices who have been left out so far, so-called passing the mic, make, making sure that others have a platform to speak. And then also guiding strong climate action. This is focusing on the big picture for corporations, businesses, foundations, improving the impact of philanthropy and making climate investing more effective. So these are the areas, and this is a graphic that you can look at on the Project Drawdown website, drawdown.org. And I'm not gonna highlight each of these, but just to mention that long-term thinking is one of the aspects that we really have to bring into our culture. We have gotten so used to thinking about one quarter ahead, and now we need to think really about a thousand years ahead. Imagine if we considered that. Okay, one of the divisions of Drawdown is Drawdown Lift, Connecting Climate and Poverty Solutions, and Kristen Patterson is the director. Kristen is focusing on those particular climate solutions that impact human well being. And I'm just going to highlight one here. Let's look over at protecting and restoring ecosystems as a climate subject head and facilitating the preservation and restoration of forests, temperate forest regeneration. And you can see by this diagram, this graphic shows that all of these solutions are needed to work together. And when they do work together, along with many other solutions that uh, can be highlighted on the Project John Darden website, we get to the point of drawdown and restoring our climate. So that's a big picture. Here's a focus on a school in a third world country where they're working on forest restoration. And what a wonderful thing for these students to learn about the impact of what they're doing and the fact that they are doing more than just restoring forests. So Kristen Patterson used this graphic, which I'm gonna magnify here. And the graphic shows that for instance, the improving agriculture and agroforestry solution, according to the drawdown research, will reduce our carbon CO2 equivalent emissions by 277 gigatons over the time period from 2020 to 2050. So that's a solution that when scaled up will improve food, income and work, water and sanitation, but the wonderful message is it has added co-benefits, improved health, gender equity, education, energy sustainability, networks that support people everywhere, and better housing. So this is one of the wonderful aspects of the drawdown research that we're looking at solutions with benefits and co-benefits. And speaking of that, let's just notice that peace is a wonderful solution. I don't know if you've noticed, but the World Economic Forum just published the fact that the world worldwide spends $15 trillion a year on violence, $15 trillion on armies and weapons, and so, et cetera. That's 13% of our gross domestic product. Just think what a benefit we'd have if we ever move beyond violence. Okay, back to Drawdown, improving the climate conversation with Drawdown stories given by Matt Scott. And Matt Scott is a storyteller extraordinaire. I really recommend that you get onto the Drawdown website and take advantage of Matt Scott's storytelling. The business leadership aspect of Drawdown is with Drawdown Labs with Jamie Alexander. And Jamie works with a series of partners. And so just for example, General Mills and IDO, Intuit and Netflix, these are partners that are working with Drawdown to get to that point where we can reduce global emissions. And here's how they're doing it. They're working with engaging hundreds of employees doing training programs, workshops, talks, and working with other media 
And so this is an example of how Drawdown is moving out into the culture and making the results of the research more effective. So just as an example here, Intuit, of course, is that company that makes TurboTax. And I just use TurboTax to do my taxes this year. And Intuit works with their customers to educate them and highlight climate solutions. Another example is Netflix. Netflix has produced films using partnership with Project Drawdown that improve the future of our world by educating people about climate solutions. And here's David Attenborough, who was part of one of the films. So Drawdown works with research to promote big solutions, investment in philanthropic strategies, convening people. And here's a, a fun thing, just at the end of what I have to say, I just wanted to highlight that Project Drawdown with their partners had a wonderful ad in the New York Times this past spring. And here's Jamie Alexander peering from beyond a clipping of that ad that was highlighting that we do have the solutions to the climate crisis and we can get there. And we are in many ways. One last note is that there is a Drawdown webinar tomorrow. So it's at www.drawdown.org. And it brings together the Drawdown Labs director, Jamie Alexander, and many others sponsored by Stanford University. And they're gonna look at how you can make advanced climbing sol climate solutions part of your job. So there's much more to be said about how these solutions are working. And I encourage everybody to look at the website and maybe catch that event. So finally, Francis, deep appreciation to you, Creatively United and Climate and the Arts. And here we go. We're going to that point in time when we actually begin drawing down the greenhouse gases out of our atmosphere. Oh, wonderful, Jim. As always, you just present things so succinctly so you can see everybody why you'd want to get involved with some of their classes and their uh, synergy sessions. So, all right, Jim, we'll do say hi to Sandy. Thank you for everything. Well, lowering our carbon, our carbon footprint is much more powerful, as we've heard at the community level, than at just at the individual level. And our next guest is a social entrepreneur and sustainability carbon footprint and employee engagement specialist. She's also the founder of Geeky Zero, an evidence-led B corporation that helps people learn to live more sustainably and take step-by-step -step actions to cut their carbon footprint. Geeky's clients include Deloitte, NatWest Group, BBC, and Oxford University, amongst others. Um, jo uh, Han joins us again from the UK. Okay, where she is working with community groups, small businesses, and large corporations to collectively reduce carbon and drive behavioral change by tracking carbon reduction by both the companies themselves and their employees using a special app. Welcome, Joe. Oh, thank you so much. It's great to be back here. Oh, I'm so glad to see you. Now, we know the corporate world can make things happen quickly when they put their minds to it. And youth are driving the need as well for companies to become more sustainable. Tell us like about like what makes your app unique and like how does it work? So we um, help, we set up Geeky to help individuals take action on climate change. And I loved what um, Tom was saying earlier about the fact that us as individuals, Thomas was saying about individuals have a really important role to play. And there was a fascinating um, report that came out from the UK Climate Change Committee a couple of years ago, which looked at behaviour change and the importance of behaviour change in solving the climate crisis. And um, it showed that 70% of greenhouse gas emissions actually could be attributed to us as individuals and households because we're so often the end user of so many goods and services. So our focus is very much on what individuals can do, both within their own lifestyles, most importantly, but also in terms of our influence. So we, um, we have an app um, which is also coupled with an engagement program and the plat the app or the platform it's it's um, super easy to use you just put in geeky zero into your search function and it, it comes up um, 
is designed so that you can understand, measure and understand your personal carbon footprint and then find ways to reduce it. And we've designed it such that all of the um, analysis and the data and the recommendations that sit behind it can actually help people get to that point of um, cutting emissions in half by 2030, which is what we need to do globally. But of course, in wealthy nations like Canada or the UK, because we tend to have much higher um, per person footprints than the global average, because wealth tends to mean higher carbon footprints, we actually have even more to do to achieve that, that global halving of emissions. So that's what the, um, the app helps people to do. And then on top of that, there's a, um, there's a kind of additional version for organizations who want to track what they're doing collectively. And we find that's really important because so often there can be a feeling of um, disempowerment as an individual. You know, there's this massive challenge ahead of us, you know, probably the biggest challenge humanity's ever faced. How on earth can we, I as an individual do anything? Um, but actually by taking part as part of your community, which might be your workplace, it might be your university, it could be your local um, you know, area or local town, um, we find that people are much more motivated to actually take action. And so as a result, they can actually track how their um, collective average carbon footprints are reducing and also all of the changes and savings that they're making together. And, and we find that's really motivating for people and that along with kind of ongoing campaigns and engagement and recommendations so that people don't kind of forget about why this is so important. Um, we, we help people over the longer term really start to embed a culture of sustainability within their organization and that that is so important because businesses and communities are going to be absolutely crucial to driving the solutions to climate change and it's people who make up those organizations and sometimes big businesses can seem this sort of faceless brand that's you know, is, is this almost like a big machine, but actually it's the people within that organization that are so crucial to the strategy and, and the future direction. And if, if the people can be motivated and, and so often they are motivated already and really want to do more, but it's just about helping them do more, learn more, find out how they can make changes. That's a really, really important part of solving the, solving the crisis that we're facing. Oh, absolutely. And I, I assume your app must be quite simple to use because it's so broad based. And it does it does it track more than carbon? Like, does it include single use plastics, water or saving important ecosystems? Yeah, so it um, tr the, the main focus is carbon, but we also look at water, land use and single use plastic. And the single use plastic side, I have to say, is quite um, scary when you see how quickly the savings on single use plastic can, can rack up when we start, you know, stopping buying disposable packages for lunch, for example, that kind of thing. So, yeah, we, we focus on all of those areas. And then within each of the um, there are about 150 different steps in there that people can choose from to, to reduce their carbon footprint. And within each of those steps, we also show what the broader benefits are. So it might be uh, it might be good at cutting carbon, but it might also be good at reducing water use or even saving money, which is obviously very relevant at the moment with the cost of living crisis. Um, but also, um, you know, cutting back on plastic um, and some well-being as well. And what's, there's often a really close correlation between a sustainable lifestyle and a healthy lifestyle. So. I think helping people understand those additional benefits is really important for motivation. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And how can Canadian corporations take advantage of this app? Like, is there a simple roadmap for enlightened corporations and their employees to follow so that they can start using this immediately? Yeah, so they should just get in touch with me um, either through our website or they can just drop me an email, which I'll put in, I'll put in the chat afterwards. But I think the, it's such a great way to get people across an organization whatever their job whatever their level of knowledge around sustainability you know they might have never thought about it before they might be real experts but to get them thinking about it together and driving conversations and I was talking to um, 
an asset manager that we work with the other day and they said, yeah, you know, we spent three days at the water cooler talking about how much water we put in the kettle when we um, when we make a cup of tea or a cup of coffee because um, you know our tendency is to fill the kettle up to the top. I don't know why it's just kind of what everybody is you know does. But actually, if you're only making one cup, you don't need very much water. And so there are lots of little steps like that just to help people start thinking about the value of our resources and and you know why waste them um, because often if we're more careful with them, not only does it protect our earth's resources but it also saves us money as well so yeah so i think so it's really we, we're um we'd love to work with canadian companies we've got canadian specific data within um geeky zero so um you can um find out specifically how your footprint looks like from from canada which is you know slightly different from the u.s to the uk and you know because we all have different different lifestyles culturally so that that's all factored in there Wow. Well, I know it can be a lot of fun, too, to challenge yourself to reduce your footprint. There is a, a film, a documentary that was produced a number of years ago that we showed at Creatively United called The Clean Bin Project. And it was about this couple. It's a true story out of, out of Vancouver area who challenged each other. Like, what could they do that would possibly be the most extreme thing that they could do? And they were kind of extreme sports kind of people. And they decided it was to reduce their carbon footprint and to um, see who could end up with the least amount of garbage after a year, I believe it was. And, and, and what they went through to do that, it was just a hilarious documentary, really um, charming. I highly encourage it. I see that it's in the chat. And, uh, and I think if someone like, you know, using your app and applying that can find that it is a lot of fun. I take great pleasure in putting out a garbage can which only has about maybe this much garbage every two months. Like it's, it's like, and it's, it, it shouldn't even be that much quite honestly, but it isn't that hard. It really isn't. And, and I think a lot of us um, older people as well will probably say that, boy, you know, clutter kind of gets you down. So if you start learning early, you know, don't buy things you don't really uh, like want or need, then you can live life more simply so others can simply live. And not only that, when you get to my age, you're not spending the rest of your life kind of clearing the clutter. <laughs> so thank you, Joe, for joining us. It's been wonderful. And we appreciate that you've joined us from the UK and it's nighttime there now. So we hope that you enjoy your evening and we'll look forward to hearing from you again. Thanks, Joe. Thank you so much. Our next guest, Ella Kim Marriott, is a Master's of Science of Rural Sociology student at the University of Alberta. Her interest lies in the environment and social well-being. As Creatively United's part-time social media coordinator, Ella keeps her finger on the pulse of the community. Welcome, Ella. You recently hosted a special Earth Day webinar for Creatively United that focused on youth-led leadership and solutions to address climate change. So can you please give us a quick recap of the top takeaways that youth want us to know? Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Francis, for having me on today's webinar. I just want to quickly recognize that I'm currently located on Treaty 6 territory, the land of the Cree, Dene, Blackfoot, Nakota, Sioux, Métis, Iroquois, uh, Ojibwe, and many other nations that have taken care of this land from time immemorial. And I'm really happy to be here to be able to speak on behalf of youth and um, to kind of give an overview of our Earth Day webinar. So uh, yeah, we had a webinar last month on Earth Day, April 22nd, and we heard from five incredible youth environmentalists and change makers, mostly located in BC, uh, working with organizations such as BCCIC's youth-led uh, climate change branch, City Hive, Raincoast Conservation Foundation, Threading Change, CPAWS, and the Sierra Youth Club podcast. So yeah, it was a great webinar. Uh, our conversation was focused on discussing what the youth-led climate movement looks like, and also what opportunities there were for intergenerational collaboration and support moving forward with the movement. And some of the amazing work that our speakers highlighted included a green jobs database to help youth find career paths related to climate change, uh, multiple youth conservation programs, 
social media work, such as an educational podcast from Sierra Club, uh, lobbying at the local and international level, uh, both in co at conferences and in offices, uh, and aiming for things like a feminist fossil fuel free fashion future. Uh, running environmental workshops on different topics related to climate change to make education about climate change more accessible to youth. Uh, and they talked about so much more than that as well. Uh, and if you haven't yet, you can watch the replay of the webinar on our YouTube channel. I think that it's been posted to the chat already. Uh, yeah, and then I also asked our speakers about what inspired them. And some of the things that they mentioned were meeting other youth through networking and participating in the movement and that we all were particularly inspired by the younger generations who are even younger than us leading the movement as early as elementary school and high school. Um, and we also stay motivated knowing that there's sort of a role and space for everyone in the movement, uh, whether you're interested in the arts, activism, education, politics, conservation, fieldwork, research, or really anything else that you can think of that you can bring to the table. And then some important points that were brought up during our discussion that I want to highlight um, when it comes to intergenerational collaboration include making sure that youth actually have a seat at the table in the designing and implementing of climate solutions, as well as any event targeting youth, uh, that youth are really part of that process of planning rather than just being invited afterwards. Um, and also making sure that there are opportunities for youth to take on leadership roles within the community, providing funding and mentorship to youth, uh, and also simply making the effort to engage in dialogue, whether it's between youth and government representatives, or even within their own families, with their own family members. Uh, and then also keeping in mind who your target audience is whenever you're trying to communicate to other generations. Um, because we want to work towards including everyone in the conversation rather than closing the door on people that we have differences to or people that seem to not understand our cause right away. Uh, and yeah, we also definitely want to work towards amplifying youth voices and other marginalized voices in the fight against climate change and recognizing the intersections that might make some people, uh, you know, the most susceptible to the consequences of climate change. Uh, but also recognizing the very diverse and uh, great perspectives that a diverse group of people can bring to the table. And then finally, something that really stuck with me was that we talked briefly about how it's really good to have a mentor who is actually younger than you as well, um, especially when we're trying to learn constantly about how climate change is kind of unfolding and the way different people are being uh, impacted by it, but also because the youth climate change movement is really making waves. Um, it's great to have a mentor who's younger than you to kind of remind you of, you know, what's what's happening that maybe you can't see from from the positionality that you're coming at things from. So, yeah, so that was some of the highlights and I'm hoping that I can answer any questions that come up later on. Well done. Well, I have to say you are a mentor to me. And so is Jake, who's behind the scenes working on uh, our tech support here. And I just have to say it's so true. The, the amount, um, the, the wisdom that was conveyed in, in the webinar that you so expertly led was, was absolutely mind boggling. So I actually really strongly encourage everyone to, to tune into that. If you haven't seen the webinar already, just have a watch. It's really worth it. Thank you, Ella, for staying on. And we'll we'll hear you at the end if anyone has any questions for Ella. In an effort to hear from all voices, we were given the opportunity to interview an environmentalist now working for a large corporate energy company. For 30 years, Susan Falk Lovesay has been applying her skills and experience to projects that create social and environmental impact in the UK. She has developed environmental projects and services for charity, local authority, and businesses, including working in partnership to establish a forest school in Norfolk and a whole country energy program. Since January 2017, Sue has worked in the offshore wind sector and has recently become stakeholder manager for Equinor, a Norwegian-owned broad energy company in Norfolk, 
Well, welcome, Sue. Thank you for joining us from the UK. And uh, first off, we should clarify the difference between the company you are working for and Equinor, the fossil energy company, which has recently spearheaded a new oil field development off the coast of Newfoundland. And it's got quite a few people up in arms, including the Council of Canadians who are raising alarm bells about it. How do you distinguish the Equinor that you are working for from the fossil fuel company? First of all, I'd like to say thank you, Francis, and to Creatively United for having me. It's a real privilege and it's an absolutely fantastic opportunity to discuss topics that are really important to me. And, you know, together we have this transition to net zero and hopefully we can do it with integrity, enabling energy security whilst also ensuring that you know, energy is affordable for people as well. And I know that's resilience is what everybody wants. Now you ask about Equinor. Well, you know, Equinor is one Equinor and the one you talk about is the same one I work for. However, I'm an environmentalist, an educationalist. All my career, I've chosen to work where I can make the biggest impact. And I believe that working for this one Equinor is the way we can make that biggest impact. I'm a holistic thinker and I'm certainly a collaborator. And this is the ethos and attitude that I think will get us to where we all need to get as quickly as possible. So I hope that clarifies things. It's one Equinor, but we're many, many people with different skills. And I think together we need to get there. Yeah, thank you. Well, I think all voices need to be at the table. Otherwise, we're in our silos and we can't move forward if we don't have all voices. So this webinar is titled for that reason. We're all in this together. So tell us about how your company is making a real difference in investing in renewable energy. I mean, there's a lot of talk about greenwashing. So how is your company committed to actually making a real reduction in our carbon footprint? Well, lots of people start with targets, and I suppose I ought to just clarify that because these targets are sort of long term targets and net zero by 2050, but they mean latest 2050. If we can do it earlier, we're going to do it. And we also appreciate, of course, that there are emissions associated with oil and gas extraction. And, you know, these need to come down by 50 percent by 2030 compared by 2015. The portfolio of renewables is absolutely so important. And that's where we're gonna make the very biggest impact. And that's going to be a portfolio that's 30 times bigger than today by 2030. Mm -hmm. And that will mean at least 50% of our annual gross investment will go into renewables. How does that translate into where I am and where I'm working? Well, in the East of England, and that's where I'm based, uh, a beautiful, beautiful location where Equinor had its first offshore wind farms. That was Sheringham Shoal and Dudgeon. Over 10 years ago, they pioneered the wind farms here. And now we're extending those wind farms. It's a very big investment and also creating new big wind farms off the northeast. Dogger Bank, for example, with other partners is 3.6 gigawatt of electricity that's the capacity now that's 10 percent of the uk domestic supply so we are talking transition here at scale on our doorstep and i mean that to me is where equinor is making the very biggest difference wonderful well some people could say you know why why would they bother continuing with oil and gas exploration when they have to shift this direction and so yeah, that's a really good question yeah, so you're you're on the inside giving the push to keep keep this side of things moving is what we're hearing, right? I'm joined by so many other colleagues and it's quite interesting. I've only been with Equinor for 4 months, okay? I've really chosen to work for this company and I've thrown myself into yes, making the impact I possibly can. And what I see is that it's a situation where it's not very helpful to be polarized. Um it's no longer necessary about sort of green offshore wind versus bad gas. I think the energy transition is a bit broader than that now. It's much more complex. And I think it's more helpful to think of it as a continuum and through a lens of uh, maybe system integration is the best word. So we need that deep offshore experience from our oil and gas colleagues for the floating wind. 
And that's going to be big into the future. We need floating wind. Uh, we need to go deeper. We need to go bigger. We need more. And that's this technology was actually inspired by Equinor colleagues who applied their knowledge from offshore oil and gas into the experience of wind. We need gas experience because we need it for blue and green hydrogen. And of course we want green hydrogen as quickly as possible. And then finally, we need the carbon capture and storage technology. You know, that's utilizing the old gas and, and oil fields under the North Sea to remove our carbon dioxide. And that's needed because we've got hard to abate sectors. You know, it's really hard to do everything perfectly all at once. And so it's that mix of those technologies that we need to furiously, I'd say, collaborate on and to make work. So for me, it's not about, I mean, we, we need to reduce our dependency on oil and gas as quickly as possible. And actually all in Equinor agree with that. You just have to look at the energy transition document and Anish Opadal's um, perspectives. Not trying to hold on to oil, it's more a case of, of the timing and going steadily and as quickly as we possibly can to where we all need to be, which is net zero. Right. Well, I'm, I'm sure there'll be a few questions around this, but what are yeah. the biggest barriers to a massive expansion of wind farms off the coast of the UK? Like, and, and how do you overcome barriers, these barriers? That's a, that's a really good question. I would say our transmission network, that's because remember, you know, oil and, we, we, well, let's, let's talk about coal. Coal and our transmission of electricity came from, you know, it, internally in the center of the UK. And now suddenly we're at scale and pace trying to get our electricity from offshore and the system isn't quite ready for it. So I would say that's quite difficult, but there's quite a lot of holistic network review going on by the government to see how we can build our resilience and capacity there. I would also say that, you know, offshore wind, is a fine solution, but of course, any development comes with some consequences. And so our host communities, you know, will see some turmoil over periods of time as we underground the cables, for example. And so we need to bring our communities with us. They need to see benefits from having offshore wind. They need to feel them locally, whether that's jobs, skills development, supply chain opportunities, net biodiversity gain, they need to feel that. And so developing those opportunities and making sure we bring our communities with us is very important. If we don't, that can become a barrier as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the third one is probably the skills. We really need to build our skills and capacity for uh, this, this transition. And that's digital skills. And it's more of the renewable engineering skills as well. Some of those skills, they'll come from the transition, from people transitioning actually from oil and gas with the right experiences and maybe from armed forces and from other sectors. But we also need new young blood coming into this. And if we don't, that could become a limiting factor too. Well, on the subject of young blood, youth have a key role in the, uh, to play in the energy transition. So how is your company engaging youth in your programs and getting them excited right. about the transition to renewable energy? I don't think you have to really probably get them excited. They're probably getting everyone else excited. I think you've got it there. That's exactly what I see. This is my favorite area of work. It's sort of where I've been working for 30 years and where I can apply my um, experience from setting up environmental centers, energy projects, for schools programs, that connection with the environment to young people's careers. And, um, and that's where I hope to be able to impact and support Equinor the most. So first of all, young people, they are so wise, you know, they come without layers of preconceptions, they come often very positively to the table. And they are very inspiring. So we always work with young people when we're doing, uh, for example, consultations. And they come along and they ask the, the best questions, they're the most challenging, and we often create solutions together. So that's number one, they're, they're inspiring to work with, so we try and include them at every step. And that's what you'll be wanting to do in Canada as well, and I'm sure you are. The second thing is, I think, is that we are accountable to our young people and we've got to work very hard to make sure we don't make this an impossible situation for them. 
And I think we owe them quite a lot of effort now to make sure they find themselves in the right place at the right time. And there's room for everybody. This diversity and inclusion lens, it's very important. We need all sorts of people and neurodiversity, ethnicity, gender diversity uh, needs to be reflected in our renewables workforce. Mm -hmm. And I suppose just to say, I think coming from outside of Equinor and having the pleasure of seeing the programmes at scale really surprised me. We have um, a graduate programme. It's a corporate programme where we work across 25 countries for the opportunities for over 150 graduates per year to work in. Now, I think it's it's the UK, US, Canada and Brazil. So, you know. There are those sort of opportunities. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, Ian Bremner, the chair of the Eurasia Group, a think tank that has just published a book called The Power of Crisis, argues that only by tackling a crisis will sufficient resources be applied to dealing with three looming crises, global health emergency, transformative climate change, and the artificial intelligence revolution. Today's governments uh, governments cannot reach a consensus on tackling these issues, but can make major gains when faced with real crisis. Do you agree that we need to be in a crisis mode before democratic governments will muster the resources to tackle climate change on the scale of your company has outlined in its strategic plan? Yeah, that's a yes. Now, I would say that a crisis can help. We look to nature, don't we? And sometimes you sort of get something happening very quickly after a crisis. And I think that it mobilizes people to work together. They suddenly see how perilous a situation can be, how um, we need to actually create more resilience and how we need to do things differently. And of course, we've had, I suppose in the UK, a few Many changes. No, they're not even many. They're big changes. You know, we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, and actually now we've got the Ukraine situation. And all those have impacted us. And you can see that the British government with industry really come together with our population to see that, um, you know, with communities as well, to see that we need to up the scale of renewable development. And solutions are being found. And I think it's quite positive. I feel being in this sector just now, where there's the the wherewithal, because you do need funding to back this transition, you really, really do, that's that's an exciting place to be. Mm. And your plan proposes a 20% reduction in emissions by 2030, a 40% by 2035 and net zero by 2050. So do you think this transition could be sped up and And what policies would that take, if so, uh, in both the private and public sectors? Right. Well, I suppose we're thinking a little bit more about the system integration challenge there, are we, do you think? Um, Sped up. Sped up means you can't just do one thing more quickly. We need to do a lot of things more quickly. We need all the tools in the toolkit. We need our offshore wind and then we need to transition quickly to floating offshore wind with all the technology that will bring. Then we need not to curtail our electricity from offshore wind just because the grid doesn't need it or isn't the demand just then. Then we need to be producing hydrogen from that offshore wind. And then we need to be blending that and making sure that our um, heating systems are being decarbonized. So. And then we need the carbon capture for where it's, like I said, hard to do a bait uh, because we can't do it all at once. So I think my answer to that is that we to do it well, we need to do all things more quickly and we need to put more effort into the collaboration and the positive outcomes and less effort into maybe fighting the detail, though, though, though it is important for our you know, host communities who care about their their own environments to be brought along and feel very much part of this as well. Well, thank you so much for taking time to join us, Sue. And we Mm -hmm. will um, follow up with you and uh, with some questions that uh, we know you'll get back to us about. So thank you again. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure. I look forward to the questions.
Our final guest before we get into our live Q&A is somebody by the name of John Kohig. And he worked in more than 100 countries with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, the founder of Transcendental Meditation, also known as TM, an international educational nonprofit providing one of the most widely researched self-development techniques. Maharishi set up countless pilot projects to inspire visionary leaders to bring prosperity to society, correct environmental imbalances, and create world peace. Among the dozens of projects that John worked on, one was in the late 1980s to help developed countries become food self-sufficient by cultivating organic food on their unused arable land. Another pilot project all ahead of its time was electric vehicles in the Netherlands and solar panel production in India. But what caught John's imagination most was the fundamental principle in all these projects, consciousness first. Welcome, John. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. And thank you for letting me listen to all of the other speakers. Everything that everyone said was um, really inspired, I think, what I, what I would like to say. Um, Gwen was talking, for example, that science was not enough to, as I interpret it, to really uncover the deeper laws of nature. There are national laws and there are indigenous laws. There are the laws of the, of the earth. And Thomas pointed out that this is not just a, a village or a community, it's a whole global effort that we are, are talking about. And everyone, even the, the name of your, of your webinar, Creative, Creatively United, really everyone was talking about the need for complete integration. So while over the years I worked on these projects with Maharshi, and I got to travel to over 100 countries, which was a great privilege, I felt after a while I wasn't a citizen of Canada, I was a citizen of the world from the province of Canada. But the basic technology that Marshy brought out was about consciousness, that all this is consciousness, an expression of consciousness. And if we want to solve all of the problems on the surface of life, we'll never solve them by trying to solve them one at a time. So for example, Climate change is what scientists call a, a wicked problem, meaning it's a problem involving the whole world with all these different decision makers who have conflicting viewpoints and values and different stakeholders with different interpretations about what's going on, what new energies, what old, what to do, <clears throat> like our last speaker about transitions. And, and then endless arguments about government policies and national economic interests that may come first, international, political, et cetera, et cetera, and then ethical and religious considerations. And though these are the sincere stakeholders. That's quite apart from selfish interests and stubborn conditioning where people just don't want to or can't see a broader, a deeper um, perspective on life. So it's a kind of a tower of Babel. So the question is, how can we work on one level that will enliven all of those levels? So if life is a tree, Maharshi had this analogy, there's so many aspects to life and all the leaves and branches and flowers and fruit and so on. And if the leaves start to wither, so there's climate change, there's so many other disasters, there's poverty, there's crime, there's war, etc. So there are diseased aspects of the world, you could say. If we try to deal with them on their own level, as Einstein said, problems are not solved on the same level that caused them. Climate change is caused by pollution, and pollution is caused by human activity, which violates the laws of nature. And so all that we're talking about when we talk about talk as activists is we're talking about changing human action, changing human behavior. But what I am suggesting is that we go deeper than that. And instead of trying to change behavior, we wake people up. People are acting the way that they're acting because that's their level of consciousness. You know, if a stressed, narrow-minded person walks into a beautiful forest, they don't see the beauty, they don't see the harmony. They don't see the trees talking to each other. They just see wood and board feet, for example. And you can't legislate morality, so there's no sense trying to, to yell at them. But if you could teach them 
programs for self-development, Maharshi taught transcendental meditation and various other programs that take the person from the surface level of thinking to deeper and deeper and deeper levels of the mind until the quietest level of the mind is reached and then transcend thought, just pure consciousness before it's expressed as me and as, as the world. I know who I am. So that's what I would like to talk about today, how adding this one thing to the mix, promoting self-realization, could solve all of the problems simultaneously, just like watering the root of the tree will distribute the nourishment to the whole tree simultaneously, and we don't have to worry about all the leaves and branches. And I know that's been proven. Uh, there was, uh, when was it, in the 70s, John, where there was a great coming together? Tell, tell us about that, where the crime rate went down uh, because of a, a group of people. And, and there is that effect, as you t- I think you've told me, the Maharishi effect, when the more people that are, that are at a level of deep consciousness, the more that the energy of the whole planet settles down. And as a result, wars decrease, crime decreases, people are happier, healthier. Um, yeah, that's a beautiful point because that's a shortcut. So what I, what I was saying before is in order for a forest to be green, the individual trees have to be green. In order for a society to behave in an enlightened way, then the individuals should be enlightened. They should develop their full potential and get rid of their stress. And then spontaneously, they act in accord with the laws of nature. But we have over 8 billion people, I think, on the planet. And what we found was that when, and we've done this in over 50 studies around the world, when people practice these technologies of meditation and advanced programs together in a group, then just a small group, maybe a couple of thousand, produces an atmosphere in, into the whole society that settles things down. And we've tested it over and over in war zones, crime rate goes down and so on, as you said. So it's called a group for a government or a group for coherence. And if you go online, tm.org, you can read more about it. But it's a very important part about it. Otherwise, trying to raise the level of consciousness of billions and billions of people is going to take a long time. It certainly seems like the solution because, well, one of the solutions, because I mean, here we are as humans, seemingly on a mission to destroy the very planet that sustains us. And it's like, so how do we create socially conscious communities? How do we get there? Like, how do we expand the container itself? Like, is, you know, um, like, how do you get to know thyself? You have to have, some people just wake up spontaneously, but that's the equivalent of reading, winning the lottery. <laughs> but you have to have a, a technique. And about 60 years ago, Maharshi revived transcendental meditation. It's an ancient technique. It comes from the Vedic tradition of India. But for, for centuries, it had been understood as being difficult. You had to concentrate and control. And he corrected that mistake and showed that Actually, it's completely effortless and simple, and anyone can learn. And over time, doing that 20 minutes twice a day for an individual, then gradually the person starts to, to wake up. Think of the difference in my behavior if I'm sleepy and dull and I don't feel good and I'm making mistakes, I'm just stressed out. Of course, I'm going to be intolerant with other people. I'm going to do things that are short-sighted. I will try to fulfill my desires in ways that will compromise others or compromise nature. And that's why there's no use preaching morality. There's no use telling the person not to do bad things because even if they know it's wrong, that stress, that weakness will drive them to do it. So the emphasis, just take 1% of the resources that are being spent around the world to mitigate, to solve the problem, not just of climate change, but all the other problems that we have in the world, not to speak of the abuse of things like artificial intelligence and genetic engineering and nuclear technology. There are a lot of scary things out there that could actually destroy the world. We could end up destroying ourselves. So don't stop all that good work, but spend 1% of the time and the energy and the resources 
on developing people's full potential on these meditation technologies that wake people up. We're, we're, we may be using 1% of our, te- of our mental potential, the creativity that we have, the insight, the intuition, the feeling of oneness. Everything we've been talking about today is about unity and oneness. You're, the name of your show, Creatively United, it, it implies that to be creative, we have to be united. But united with what? United with everything, with our, with our own inner self. Mm-hmm. And the word university, the word universe, it's all unity and diversity. So 1% of what we're spending on changing diversity, on developing through direct experience, the unity of life, which is by finding our own inner self consciousness, which is really the basis of everything. Everything is an expression of consciousness. Um, just briefly, please go to tm.org. And if you put in CA, you'll get the Canadian Transcendental Meditation site. But you'll also find there that this has parallels in physics. You know, science, physics is to go from the obvious known through deeper and finer and finer levels of of what life is, reality. So you go to the atomic level, subatomic, and then it just becomes just fields, fields of energy, gravity, electromagnetism. As Niels Bohr said, all that we perceive as being matter is based on what it, things that are not matter. And then ultimately, Einstein's unified field, which we would say is consciousness. And so even physics is moving towards the one solution to everything is to know who we are and to directly experience the wholeness, the totality. You have these great sayings in the Vedas, aham brahmasmi, I am totality, I am that, you are that, all this is nothing but that. So know thyself and all else will be known kind of thing. So thank you, Francis. Thank you very much. And to all the other speakers, thank you. Oh, thank you. Wow, what a wealth of knowledge shared. And before we launch into our live q and I'd like to summarize some of the key takeaways. One of the key take-home messages from Series 4 of Climate in the Arts is that communities are the beating heart of coordinated actions to substantially reduce our carbon footprint and avert climate disaster. People working together with a common purpose and values in a democratic society embedded in the rule of law and personal freedoms can transform our economy, culture, and create social justice. Connectedness is a fundamental principle of nature, nurturing each component so all rise and flourish together, learning and communicating with each other so we can adapt to rapidly changing circumstances Strengthening bonds that are essential ingredients for continuous improvement in technology, governance, and just social systems. The power of crisis is essential in all ecosystems to create conditions for step change leading to regeneration rather than incrementalism and decay. Leaders are found wanting to create the required transformational change, but disruptive technology and increasing crises in food distribution, water availability, and public health emergencies will galvanize communities finally to take the necessary coordinated actions and empower their political leaders to take the courage to bring in the legal and institutional reforms necessary to implement these changes. And universal consciousness, It's the only force that existed before the Big Bang. It exists in different forms in energy fields, in organic matter, all life forms, and of course, human intelligence. The ubiquitous of consciousness will strengthen as we face the oncoming climate and biodiversity crisis, eventually empowering humanity as a whole to live within Earth's planetary boundaries to create more socially just societies. And finally, but not least, the arts. They are an essential motivator for creating these changes. Artists are most in touch with universal consciousness and help us all realize the power of changing our behavior. We have to transform from a society of self-centered individuals to a new society based on living within planetary boundaries. Our indigenous brothers and sisters have shown us the way. And now we must reconcile to work collectively on this new approach. We're all in this together. This is the only way we can make the necessary transformative changes. Hope springs eternal. Hope is action. 
Surround yourself with possible, positive possibilities. Don't listen to negative people. They have a problem for every solution. If you want to draw an inspiration, please revisit the many shows in our webinar series to learn of the many actions and solutions available to us all. And be sure to stay connected through creativelyunited.org's free community solutions sharing hub, where you'll find events, resources, videos, and even our free downloadable 58 solutions for lighter and healthier living. Now for our Q&A. Let's move to that. So thank you for everyone to everyone for sticking in there. Thank you to our speakers who would like to see you all come on again. This would be fabulous. And we're going to work our way through some of these questions. So um, I know a few have been answered, but um, there's, there's, there's one here. Uh, and we'll, we'll have a few people speak to this. From Sandra. Thank you, Sandra. I appreciate, she says, personal responsibility and welcomes suggestions for reducing our footprint. But I am unsettled by the offloading of responsibility from corporate contributors with their outsized impacts onto us individuals. I'm reducing our family footprint, but I'm frustrated and overwhelmed by the large and seemingly unresponsive contributors focused on continuing to make money despite the impacts. Their impacts so outweigh my efforts. What are the best places to put my limited energy to help hold corporate players accountable? Who'd like to, uh, I think Thomas said he'd like to answer that first. Okay. Thank you, Thomas. Well, I just want to put a, an interesting spin on it, I guess, having been involved in the corporate and the business world uh, for much of my career. Um, there is uh, a very easy way to control corporate behavior, and that is by what you buy from them. Um, corporations are all about selling products and selling services, and if they don't have a revenue stream, they don't exist. So the masses, not necessarily the individual, but the masses have a huge impact on corporations. Mind you, they use some of the revenue that we give them to try to convince us to spend more revenue on them. But being car free for 20 years and having saved over $400,000 in our family over that 20 years by not owning cars has shown us personally the impact that we can have, right? That's $400,000 we didn't feed into a revenue stream that drives that kind of behavior. Now, um, we can't do it as individuals. Corporations have to do their part. And there's no question in my mind about that. But corporations aren't, are also made up of people. And it was mentioned here in, by a number of speakers that it's the people. I think Joe talked about it and, and, and even the gal from Equinor talked about it, is that it's the people within the corporations that are going to determine where the corporations go. And this is why, to me, the idea of having a common pledge that we encourage our coworkers and we encourage our corporations, we encourage our customers, we encourage our suppliers to participate in that says we need to work together as a global tribe to find the solutions and embrace the complexity of our time, right? And stop pointing fingers at each other and saying, I'm good, you're bad, right? I'm, I'm doing the right thing, you're doing the wrong thing. If we don't recognize that we're all in this together, then we're gonna continue battling it out in the trenches while the sky is falling. And, and that's just not gonna work. That's for certain. So that's an excellent answer to an excellent question. And who else would, anyone else wanna comment on that? Oh, we'll go, uh, we'll go Jim and then, and then I'll go to, to Joe. I really liked what Thomas said. And I think that's at the heart of it. We need to reduce the demand. Corporations respond to demand. And uh, so that's the start of it. And we can all do that in our lives. One of the movements that I find very exciting is uh, the movement that's called the Third Act, Bill McKibben. And uh, Bill has put it out that, you know, the older folks may not have um, the time on the earth that the younger folks do, but we have a lot of resources. And one of the things we can do is put those resources where they do the most good work. And so the third act I would recommend is a way that we can all tune in to ways that make an impact on corporations. And one of the things that they've taken on right off the bat is letting the big banks know that if they want to invest in fossil fuels, they're going to lose our money. They'll respond to that. I have a lot of faith. 
Thank you, Jim. And Joe. Thank you. I would say um, that there's often this debate about, you know, is it corporations? Is it individuals? Is it governments? And the reality is because we have known about climate change now for 40 plus years and have um, embraced growing emissions globally um, in, a, in a kind of joyful way, um, we have left ourselves with no option now that we have to do absolutely everything. So corporations need to change. We as individuals need to change the way we do things. Even our, our much loved uh, queen who is about to uh, celebrate her platinum jubilee, she was even saying, we need to change the way we do things. Um, and policy needs to deliver. And when policy is, is, is well drafted and well created, it is a massively powerful driver, but it has not done what it could have done in the last uh, previous decades. So we're left in a position where we're kind of scrambling, the clock's ticking, and we all have to contribute now. It's not, it's not an either or, it's, it's everybody and everything, because that's the only way we'll get to the emissions reductions that we really need to see. Thank you. Anyone? Oh, Claire, I see a hand. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I um, one of the things that I feel absolutely what what's being talked about, but I think um, we don't do that much um, mapping ourselves ecologically. So we don't most people have no idea where the watershed is and where the water is coming from. And so all of those ecosystems are so interconnected into everything else. And yet cities are planned without that ecological mapping, it's kind of where humans want to put it. And so it's kind of like this big shift. And so that the consciousness piece that um, John was talking about, I just think is so huge because when we are aligned ecologically, the other piece is so much easier to do. And yet uh, that's where I don't see corporations doing enough to get that conversation, like to help with the fun, like, you know, for communities need to do this themselves, but they need the facilitating. And um, I think that would be very powerful. John, did you want to jump in on that one? Like, how do we how do we get the corporate lead? I mean, it's the leaders, the, the so-called leaders that mm-hmm. need to be taking this approach. Yes, it's leaders and also it's ordinary people. It's everybody. Yes. And it's corporations, it's entities, it's it's government and politics. It's it's education, it's the healthcare system, you know, everything needs to change and there are so many problems. So um, it's again, as I said, it, it's, a, it's the principle of the second element. You have a problem on the surface, as Einstein said, but rather than trying to tackle it on its own level, some action is wrong, let's force them to change the action. That kind of never ends and it creates bad feeling and pushback and we know all of that. What we found in these conflict zones, there was a a beautiful exam, uh, example done in the 70s in Washington, D.C., which has they call the crime capital of the world. Mm-hmm. And um, we brought in 4,000 meditators, and for a week or two, they all did their practice together. It was very simple. And if, if you go online, I can send you the link so you can, you can share it. The headlines in the Washington Post were unbelievable. It was basically, what happened? It's as though heaven opened up. President Clinton had formed, had um, been in power for six months and hadn't even been able to form a cabinet. All of a sudden, all that was solved. Crime rate went down 25%. And all these headlines were just showing what a difference a week makes. What happened? There can be no reason for this. So you don't have to address corporations directly. Of course, you want to. But if you raise the coherence in the society as a whole, then all of these things start to fall into place. People begin to act more in a more mature way, in a more holistic way, because that's inherent to life. That's inherent to human beings. I know deep inside that I'm connected with the whole. And that's why I I was suggesting, let's add self-development to the mix. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. And uh, Ella, did you want to add anything? Anyone else? Yeah, I can add, I kind of just want to reiterate, especially what uh, Jim was saying before with holding banks accountable. And I wanted to highlight uh, that there is a youth-led organization that is working towards that. It's called 
uh, Bank for Better Future. Um, and I think that the work that they're doing is really awesome. Uh, and, you know, coming at it from a youth perspective too, like we have all these choices that we're making um, as we don't have a lot of these like same responsibilities or like investments um, that now we have to pull out. It's, it's really great being a young person, being informed on issues related to climate change, because I get to decide like from this point on where I invest my money and how I want to build up my lifestyle and everything. So, um, so yeah, I think that there's a lot of opportunity for youth in that way. Uh, and then, yeah, I also just wanted to reiterate the fact that I think that demand does have a lot of power and consumers do have a lot of power in two of the main areas that we've kind of seen that in. Um, I guess from also like a sort of youth led perspective is with fashion and secondhand fashion and slow fashion, uh, as well as with sort of vegetarian and veganism diets. Uh, and yeah, I just, those two examples always come to my mind because I think that they really illustrate how there are lots of changes coming to the market that are based in a concern for climate change specifically. Uh, and yeah, I also wanted to just talk about how I think it's, if we're talking about individual action and how to translate that again with this sort of like market demand side of things, um, leading by example is actually extremely important and we do have a major ripple effect on other people uh, and something that I've learned um, kind of just looking into like the psychology behind consumerism uh, really talking to people about like why you make certain choices in your life uh, can be really beneficial because uh, or also even just talking about what you're doing because oftentimes people feel more accountable um, and there's sort of like this sense of solidarity that people have where when someone is taking an action and it really empowers other people to do that as well. So uh, any kind of activism or like consumer changes or whatever it is that you're taking, I think that having lots of conversations about what you're doing and not just keeping it to yourself, but really bringing other people into that. Um, I think that's kind of one way to kind of gauge that people power uh, and change some of those markets. Well said. That's why Ella's my mentor. <laughs> <laughs> Fabulous. And there's a comment I'd like to even share from one of our um, participants uh, on the show. This is from Andrew. It's a comment. He says, those already aware of the concept of all is one. If it's not good for everyone, it's not good at all. Earth is our collective mother. You are the awareness consciousness within the body. You need to declare that as such. And so connect with those who share the same values. And I think what he's basically saying and help bring other people along in the, in the, in the discussion. So discussion, very important. One of the big challenges for individual action is the inequity between the haves and the have nots. How does drawdown assist the lower income people and the minorities um, in taking action for improving their well being, but also contribute to drawing down their carbon footprint? Now, um, Jim, did you want to start with that? Yeah, I, I give it a, um, a probably a very cursory look. Uh, I'd encourage everybody to go to the Drawdown website, uh, www.drawdown.org. And there's much more in the area that's called Drawdown Lift. And the lift is about lifting people up into more sustainable and vibrant lifestyles. And it's really directed at activities that can be done in many parts of the world that are less developed, where there are less uh, supported lifestyle improvements. And so I highlighted that when I was talking, uh, an improvement that improves water. And you think about how precious water is to all of us. And uh, we all live in areas that uh, really need to deal with as it comes up. And so part of the drawdown research shows that solutions are interactive. So you can improve water by planting new plantings in forests. And so that was the picture of the kids that uh, had all the plantings that they were working on. And uh, just to finish with, I think there is nothing too small to be done. You know, we have this idea that it, impacts need to be world scale, and, and they do. But each of us can do one small thing, like planting a plant to restore the forest. 
And uh, the example that I love so much is the example of Gandhi when uh, there was a colonial effort to make money on salt, he went to the ocean and started making salt himself. And that was made illegal, but he did it anyway. And that spread and it just caught people in their hearts. And so, you know, it's just nice to remember that uh, very big changes can come from small, seemingly uh, insignificant solutions. Now, it's very interesting what you say about water. I'll come to you in a sec here, John, if you have a hand up. I'm not sure if that's for this, but um, yeah, that water is the unifying force. We've had programs on this and it'll be the unifying, probably one of the major unifying forces as we start experiencing climate change in a bigger way. So yes, just even watching your water consumption it, you know, like in your own watershed. So that doesn't necessarily involve a corporation. Like maybe you don't wash your car. You know, it drives me crazy when I see people washing cars during a drought. <laughs> so, so there's things like that. I just want to respond a little bit to the, to the water issue because you're absolutely right. It is a unifying force, but crises also tends to polarize us. If we don't overcome this notion of us versus them, then it becomes a battle between I need the water for agriculture. No, I need the water for the city. No, I need the water for industry. And now what we're doing is we're starting to entrench ourselves again into groups of, of lobbyists, groups of advocates for using water in our, to our benefit and to uh, su support the, the kind of things we think are important. And so the thing that's missing in that is, a, is the backdrop, right? If the backdrop remains an adversarial environment of us versus them in whatever form it takes, then it's easy for us to say, well, I, we're doing the right thing by conserving water for this purpose, but you shouldn't be using it for that purpose, right? And yet if we change the backdrop to recognize that we're all in this together, that this is really one that the only boundary to our tribe should be the upper limits of our atmosphere, then we can start to say, okay, how can we work together? How can we all share the resources of water so that we all can uh, preserve it together and we can all benefit from it together and we can apply the technologies in a constructive way together. And that's when we find the solutions mm -hmm. because then we move ourselves away from focusing on the villains right? Because we all love villains. We all love pointing the finger at somebody else. They should do this. Government should do that. Corporations should do that. Individuals should do more, right? Everybody likes pointing the finger outside. But if we get rid of the outside, if it's all us, now we're starting to work together to try to find solutions. And I really think that that is, in whatever form it takes, that is the core of what's missing. We have grown to a global scale with our communications, with our viruses, with our technology, with our uh, energy, everything is global, except our thinking. Our thinking is still mired in local small tribalism. And that needs to catch up. Mm -hmm. Okay, now, John, over to you. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, um, mainly, I wanted to appreciate what Thomas was saying. And I, I really liked your talk, Thomas, you were saying I took a couple of notes that that it's not just a local problem, village, city, it's, it's a global problem. And everything that you said just now, that there is so much connectedness now through the internet, through technology, more and more people are sensing that they're part of a global community. And years ago, I remember Maharshi was saying once that patriotism, my country, is a very juvenile concept. It should be something that once you're 15 years old, you now graduate to internationalism. There's an old saying in India, the world is my family. And if, if I really feel that, um, as you were saying in your talk, if we really feel this in our heart, then we'll commit, it's spontaneous. And that's why self-development comes in in these meditation technologies, because why don't I feel it in my heart? Why am I disconnected when the natural state of life is that we are all one. It's not an intellectual concept. And that's why the key 
Otherwise, we'll just be telling people, but you can't tell a blind person to see. The key is to wake the people up to when you reach the source of thought, when I reach my innermost, my real unbounded nature, what I am in essence, not just the expressions, I'm the white screen, not just the movie projected on it, then that all is a cognition. I see it, I feel it, and I don't feel differences. I see myself in, in everyone. So I, I'm suggesting that, Ree Thomas, all the beautiful things that you said, and you really said them nicely and you have a very relaxed and soft kind of air about you, that this is the way to awaken it in people and then you don't even have to tell them. When I can see the trees, I don't have to be told that they're there. So how do people, I guess the question I would think that some of the public would have is, well, where do, where do I get going on this? How do I get going on this? And that's why we're going to have all these links in our chat to share with the replay. So you'll be able to connect with organizations and groups and like-minded people. And um, yes, and as Thomas put up, he has a pledge as well that is just beautiful. So please do um, review that. If there's anything else that we didn't get to that you'd like to share, here's your opportunity. Ella, would you like to go first? Uh, I think that well, uh, what I will add uh, to the end of this conversation is just that uh, I think it's really important to look for those opportunities for collaboration between um, between youth and other people involved in this work. Uh, and one example that I'll use is based off of uh, one of the previous speakers who was talking about the energy transition. Um, there are, I feel like there's always youth organizations and other organizations led by experts, teachers, whoever it is, um, that are working on very similar issues. And if those groups were to join forces in a lot of cases, I think that we could really make waves. So two of those organizations working on the just transition movement are Iron and Earth, um, located primarily in Alberta, and the organization Student Energy, which is really trying to bring in the youth voice to that conversation. So yeah, just kind of always looking for those opportunities. I'm sure also if anyone has ever trying to host an event and they're trying to bring youth out or even trying to engage with youth for job opportunities or volunteer opportunities. Um, yeah, just making sure that youth are providing you feedback throughout that process uh, and not you're not just designing something that you think they'll be interested in, but that you're actually giving them um, an opportunity to contribute to, to designing what that will look like. Fantastic, thank you. How about you, Joe? I would just say that we shouldn't underestimate the magnitude um, of the need for education still. And I don't mean education in schools because we can't pass this on to the future generation. I mean, education of adults today, because um, the majority, I would say now have a broad um, awareness that the climate is changing, but for many people, it doesn't go beyond that. And actually, to galvanize change, people really need to have a clarity of understanding in terms of what they can tangibly do and why it's so important, why inaction is not an option. And I think that we as individuals can really play an important part in that because most people are most inclined to change, be they corporate leaders, uh, prime ministers, uh, you know, the man down the street, uh, when they're influenced by people that they respect and, th and, and, and have high regard for. So actually, if we can all influence 5, 10, 20 people in our network to understand why it's so important that we need to change and, and the world needs to change, um, that would go a long way to helping address the, the magnitude of the challenges that we face. Mm -hmm. Well said. Thank you. Jim, do you want to jump in now? Love to. So much has been said that's so good. It brings to mind an image that I have of a little girl and I was walking her down to the beach one day and she looked up at the clouds above and she said, how much does a cloud weigh? <laughs> and it just, it just said to me, this is the kind of curiosity and openness that I think says awakening. There is an awakening soul, awakening to nature, awakening to what things are. 
That's so lovely. It's Thank gonna you. happen. Yeah. Beautiful. And Claire. Yeah, I well, I love what you've just said there, Jim. And maybe I'll just follow on that is that I think collectively we have the most incredible wisdom, but we 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 kind of disregard how powerful it is when we work together. And I think those are the skills that we really need um, is how do we work collectively um, for that emergent wisdom that is latently there, but we, we still are so isolated from each other. So finding ways, and I think the ecology, the bioregional local place that you live is that place where we could come together, but we need the skills and the tools. And there, there are tools like pro-social and others. So. Thank you, Francis. Well said. And John, just a quick one. Trading on what Joe said, we need to educate people, adults and everyone. And I would just add that education means, you know, changing or adding to the container of the mind. But add to that expanding the container itself, expanding the mind, expanding the consciousness, increasing creativity, insight, and all these beautiful inherent qualities. And then we educate ourselves. Thank you. Thank you all so much. What an incredible program. And we're seeing that in the comments too. So thank you to everyone for hanging in, tuning in and for taking action. Until the next time, let's just keep being creatively united. Bye for now, everyone. Thank you. Bye.